So as we continue our study on the early church in the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit pouring over and into God's people. And I believe, and we know this for a fact, that God's going to do that again. And I believe it's in our lifetime. May we learn to seek and wait for His Spirit. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have Jesus, your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I know. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. We're going to sing that hallelujah. Amen. Jesus, you're still me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your this is my confidence, you've never failed. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this
Jesus, your promises will never fail us. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail.
Church, happy Sabbath to you and your family. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us for worship this morning, and I know that God's going to richly bless us as we worship Him today. Today is a special Sabbath. We have a guest speaker, Dr. Tem Piranish, who will be ser serving us today by sharing the message. He's already been with us yesterday evening for Vespers, this morning for Sabbath school, and he's also going to be having a question and answer session at 3 p.m. today. So we welcome you to join us this afternoon on the same Zoom site. We also want to challenge the church to join Pastor Glenn in the Daniel Challenge. You saw the letter that Pastor Glenn sent out to you this week. He is challenging the church to join him in the Daniel Challenge. In brief, the challenge goes like this. Week one, he's asking us to just take one day of the week where we eat only fruits, vegetables, and drink water. Week two, it's going to be two days, fruits, vegetables, and water. Week three, three days, fruits, vegetables, and water. And we're simply going to be following Daniel's principle of healthy living. And I know that God's going to teach us a lesson. And hopefully, we too will be a little wiser, a little smarter, and some of us maybe even a little lighter. One last announcement, folks, and that is next Sabbath is our outdoor worship service once again. This time, however, we're doing it at 12 noon. That's right, 12 noon. So next Sabbath, October 24, we would like to welcome you to join us at the Hinsdale Academy field at 12 noon. We would like you to please continue with your Sabbath school classes online, and then you have an hour to make your way to HAA field. For those of you who live a little closer and you can come a little earlier, we're going to welcome you to bring yourself a sack lunch so that you can have your sack lunch with us in your designated circles with your family. Remember, bring your mask, bring your lawn chair, and stay in your designated areas with your immediate family. Now, Pastor Glenn is still going to record a message, and we will have a live service that will be released at 11 a.m. next Sabbath. So if, if there's a weather problem, or for those of you who can't make it, you can still enjoy worship service next Sabbath at 11 a.m. Of note, Pastor Glenn will be preaching the same sermon. So, for those of you who want to watch us online and then come in person, you'll get a double blessing next Sabbath. We look forward to seeing you. We look forward to see what God is going to do with our church, especially this special weekend. May God richly bless us as we worship Him today. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. We worship a God who, in moments like these, shows up in His glory when we come together in song and praise and worship. And even though we may be separated right now physically, um, it doesn't mean that the Spirit uh, isn't connecting us together right now 
as we come together in Jesus name so I invite you all to remember that that even though we're physically distant uh, we're worshiping together right now in spirit and truth and Jesus presence his glory is here
show us your glory, Lord. I pray that no matter what, Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Be thou, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought. By day or by night Waking or sleeping Thy presence my I am a 
were a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Our Father in heaven, we are here to give you praise and thanksgiving on this wonderful Sabbath day. We praise you and worship you for all you've done to our church family. We give you thanks for your gift of healing to all the victims of this pandemic and ask you for your continuous healing of the whole world. Lord, please forgive all our shortcomings and weaknesses. Please continue to guide each and every one of us in following you and studying your word. Lord, please continue to bless our congregation, our church leaders, our members, our church members, and their families. Please continue to bless our youth, our adventurers, especially to all the students who are studying far away. Keep them safe always and guide them. Lord, we leave up to you today our speaker, Dr. Tim, May he deliver your message to us to touch our lives and cherish our faith in you. May we realize that we have so many reasons to believe. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. I hope that you are blessed wherever you are today. You know, you may not know this, but every fall I like to focus on prophecy. And this year, we are doing a series called End Time Faith. I hope it's been a blessing so far. But today, I've recruited some help. He's a good friend of mine. He's a doctor from Florida. In fact, we went to the same church uh, just three years ago. He currently teaches a Sabbath school there. And we're so blessed to have him with us here today. His name is Dr. Timothy Peranick. And before Dr. Timothy Peranek speaks, I want to invite you, church, to put your thinking cap on today because you will need it. We are going to be talking about the deeper things of God. And I'm so excited that he is going to share with us. And I pray that you all will receive this truth and just be blessed and that your faith would, would be strengthened for the times that we live in. Because indeed, we're going to need end time faith. So, God bless you. Happy Sabbath. And thank you for tuning in and giving him your undivided attention. How do you know what's important to God? There's a text in the Bible, it's Genesis chapter 41, verse 32, and it says, And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because of the thing established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Pharaoh's dream was repeated to him twice because God was telling him that it was important and that it was certainly going to happen. So anything that God repeats over and over again in a vision or in a dream is important to him. If the dream that saved so many people from famine in Egypt was important to Pharaoh and also to Joseph and his family, changing the course of history, for the Israelites, then what else is important in the Bible? You'll soon find out. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, I ask for your Holy Spirit as we go through the Word of God, just looking at some things that you find very important. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. There's one prophecy that I would love to get into, except for that it takes a lot of time and there's a lot of detail to it. And it's the 1260 day prophecy. But what I want you to look at, what I want you to see is the emphasis about it in the scriptures. I think there is a needed opportunity to actually get into it, but I just want you to get a sense of what God is emphasizing here. First text we're gonna look at is Daniel chapter seven. Daniel chapter seven, we're gonna start in verse 19. And he says this, reading from the New King James. 
He says, Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was exceedingly different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured and broke into pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and about the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely, the horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. It goes on. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth which shall be different from all the others, uh, all the other kingdoms, and shall devour the, the whole earth, trample it, and break it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be different from the first ones, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, and he shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws, and the saints shall be given to his hand for times, time, and half a time. Now, just looking at this, we're just getting a feel. We're not going to get into every detail, even though they are all very important. But notice that Daniel, in the beginning of this passage, wants to know the truth about this fourth beast, and he wants to know particularly about the little horn, which he sees is going to last to the end of time, which is going to be destroyed by the Ancient of Days. And so the angel, bringing the vision to him again, reemphasizes it, gives him more detail about it, but then points out that this character, this little horn, this beast, is going to intend to change times and laws and is going to reign for time time and half a time, or 1260 years, 1260 days, three, three and a half years, 42 and a half months, 42 months, three and a half years. All of them are the same, but notice the emphasis that you need to know exactly when this, this terrible creature, this, this character was going to rule. But this isn't the only time that it's emphasized. Let's go again, we'll be stay in Daniel. We're gonna go to Daniel chapter 12. And in Daniel chapter 12, after a whole series of Daniel chapter 11 talking about the kingdom of the north, the kingdom of the south, and dealing with all the things in there, and coming to a crescendo, and talking about even the resurrection in the early verses of, da of Daniel chapter 12, he goes on to reiterate this same prophecy. And he, he starts here in verse 7. He says, Then I heard a man clothed with linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and left hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever, that it shall be a times, time, and half a time, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. And he said, Daniel, and so he goes, although I heard, I did not understand, and then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wickedly, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Again, towards the very close of this book, which not only gives the prophecy of the Messiah, but the rise and fall of different nations, the 1260 days, the three and a half years, is reiterated yet again. If Pharaoh had a dream that was repeated twice, and it was important for him to know, what do you think, just in one book, this same prophecy is yet repeated? Could it be that knowing who this special power is that is going to wear out the saints, that is going to cause them to be persecuted, and cause some that are going to purify themselves and be made white in the affliction of persecution? I think so. But let's go on, because this isn't just emphasized twice. It's also emphasized again here in Revelation chapter 12. Let's go ahead and look. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. And it reads... 
His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And to her, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So here we are, we are looking at this. This prophecy deals with the Antichrist power, which is persecuting the saints. It deals, it identifies the church in the wilderness, and it has now been emphasized here three times. But the Bible's not done. The same prophecy is then emphasized in the very same chapter once more. Let's just turn a page, if, if that's how your Bible is. But it is also in Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. And then it says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the child. But the woman was given two wings of a great e e eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she will be nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Again, re-emphasizing 1260 days, three and a half years, 42 months, all re-emphasized over and over again. This is now the fourth time that we have here. But let's go on. We'll go, actually, we're going to go back one chapter to Revelation 11. Because this is now, again, the fifth time, sixth time, actually this is the fifth time. It goes on, Revelation 11, 1 through 6, and it says this, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. There it is. Verses back to back emphasizing exactly what is to happen, not only to God's people, but also to his two special witnesses which we believe, the Old and New Testament, as it says in verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. We're looking at this. Notice how many times it's emphasized, and yet there's still one more. Let's go here to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 through 8. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints to overcome them. And the authority was given over every tribe, nation, and tongue. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the land that was slain from the foundation of this world. Listening to the language, do you not think it's important to know when this time period is applied? Look how many times it is found in Scripture. We love Jesus and we love to read the Gospels about Him. But when we look at this, why is it that the prophets, Daniel and John, spend so much time emphasizing this power which is to wear out the saints, which is to mark the rise and diminishment of the Antichrist power. Why emphasize this so much? Shouldn't we be talking about love? Shouldn't we be talking about something happy? But there's a reason for this. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because I would assert that if you don't know who this power is, you might not know Jesus. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses, we'll start here, verses 1, verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together to Him, we ask you, now think about it, verse 1, 
He's talking about the coming of Jesus. It's ironic that to talk about the Antichrist power is to help us to know when Jesus is coming, but that's what he starts off with. He's talking about the second coming of Jesus, and he says, this, we ask you not to be soon, soon shaken in mind nor troubled by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. He starts off right there. This is about the second coming of Jesus. And he says, verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come first, unless a falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The first thing that Paul emphasizes is an apostasy in the church and the rise of the son of perdition. And this is to tell us about the coming of Jesus. Maybe thinking about this 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, maybe understanding that helps us to understand what our Lord and Savior is doing and what we must all face. But he goes on, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? Think about that. To understand the second coming of Christ, you need to understand that who the son of perdition was, where he would be sitting, and what he would do. And notice this. Notice why it's so important. Notice what he says here in verse 7. He says, The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. That's another important verse to help you identify the Antichrist. Verse 8, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. He has spent the majority of the verses talking about the second advent, discussing the Antichrist power. If Paul thinks it's important to help the believers in Thessalonica understand who the Antichrist is so they can appreciate the second advent, what about us? He goes on, the coming of the lawless one will be is according to the working of Satan with all powers, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive a love of the truth that they might be saved. What could that love of the truth be? Could it be loving and understanding prophecy? Could it be that one of the most overlooked prophecies concerning the 1260, 42 months, three and a half years, all highlighting the Antichrist is actually a key to understanding eschatology. It seems to be that way for Paul. It seems to be emphasized over and over again by both Daniel and John, who are writing in quite a different time. You're talking hundreds of years, centuries after centuries have passed, and both in vision are highlighting the same power and what it's going to do to the saints. Just listening to this, would you not think it's important that if you can't identify this, you might be falling for the strong delusion? Here are some key things that I think you should know about this Antichrist power. Because how you interpret it sort of frames how you think about the second coming of Jesus. It's very interesting because either Jesus is coming in the clouds as Paul emphasizes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with the, the sound of a trumpet with the, voice of an, with, sorry, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ are rising first or you believe that he's coming secretly and everyone is changed in the twinkling of an eye without the resurrection. That is based. That two different ideas about how Jesus is going to come is, doesn't boil down to just how we think Jesus is, but it boils down to who you identify as the Antichrist. How do you apply the 1260 days? How do you apply the 42 months of three and a half years? How do you do it? The 1260 days also helps us to understand, the three and a half years also helps us to understand the nature of Christ's coming. You see, this Antichrist power must receive a deadly wound, and this wound must be healed before Christ's return. This helps us to understand when the time of the end is and how we should be preparing. It also points to another lesser known prophecy of the 2300 days, which comes after the 1260. But we go on. There was a man who, his name was Hugo Grotius. 
and he was a Dutch Protestant, and he determined that the one issue that kept Protestants and Catholics from uniting was how they interpreted the 1260 days and how they applied scripture to the Antichrist. And what he determined was, is he felt that if the interpretation could be shifted, then Catholics and Protestants could unite. It's fascinating to think that just one prophecy means so much. Did you know that foreign policy is literally negotiated on this idea of who the Antichrist is and who the Antichrist isn't? You see, if you believe the Antichrist is some guy who may come from Europe, who may ascend to the UN, then you're going to have a different policy on matters in the Middle East than you might if you believe that the, that the system of Romanism as applied from the 6th century on is the system of the Antichrist, you're going to have a different take. And yet foreign policy is literally made on an understanding of who the Antichrist is and is not. And this affects the entire world that we live in. The 1260 days, if you do not understand it, or the misapplication of the Antichrist, also obscures the temple. Do you know that there are people who are gathering money around the world to save, to rebuild the temple? Because they believe that if they can rebuild the temple, the Antichrist will reveal himself and then Christ will come? And yet, what we read here in 2 Thessalonians is that this pompous, arrogant, Antichrist power sits in the temple of God saying that he is God. Protestant reformers believed that that was none other than the popes and the legates and the curia of Rome. In other words, they had established in the minds of men that they spoke for God and people believed it. And therefore, this was a way of sitting in the temple of God. Know you not that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? You see, how you understand who the Antichrist is changes what you think the temple of God is. Which is important because then shall the sanctuary be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days. This actually opens up even more theology when we think about what is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Finally, the most important aspect about understanding who the Antichrist is, is it obscures our relationship and our understanding of who Christ is. You see, the ancients believed that there would come a man who would be filled with Satan and would come and take over the world and this is who they thought the Antichrist or the liar power would be. And so when they, when they believed that, they thought that the Messiah would be a man who would be filled by the Holy Spirit and he would come and he would wage war to free the Jews off the face of the earth. Just by misinterpreting the Antichrist, the Jews at the time thought that the Messiah would be someone who would overthrow the evil in this world like a David and a, because they believed that the Antichrist was a very much a human being filled with evil. That's what they thought. And because of that, they rejected Christ when he came as a lamb suffering from the foundation of the world. Just looking at this, you begin to realize the ramification for every ounce of Scripture. If we can just go back to the text that I read in the beginning. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and will shortly come to pass. The 1260-day prophecy is repeated actually more than that. And it has come to pass. Do we recognize it? Are we ready? And have we identified the true enemy of Scripture so that we may be ready for Jesus' coming? Thank you for listening. God bless. May we always remember that Jesus is faithful. There's nothing we could do to earn his love, his salvation. He gives it to us freely, no strings attached. It's not too good to be true. God is simply too good, and he's true. May we learn to live in the goodness of God. Oh, 
your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good Every breath that I am made I will sing the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness Your goodness is running after It's running after me running after it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness running after it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will see of the goodness of God. So fellow Bible students, I hope that you are blessed today. Dr. Tim, thank you so much for that powerful word. And thank you, Lord, that you repeat the lessons that we need to hear because sometimes we don't get it if it's just once or even twice. Sometimes you have to repeat it so that we can really learn it and that we can really believe it. So God bless you all today. Would you take someone's hand? Would you take someone's shoulder? And let's pray with and for each other, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for the deeper things in your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can, you look into your word and all the mysteries, Lord, really, we, could, we can find out and we can, ha we can know with clarity if we're willing uh, to be led by your Holy Spirit and to seek for truth. So, Lord, please help us to learn, help us to continue to grow in our faith so that in the end we can stand 
though the heavens fall. Please bless your people. Thank you so much for Dr. Tim. Thank you for all the Bible students. We want to grow closer to you, and we want to grow stronger in our faith. So hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. I've seen you move. Jesus, your promises will never fail us. Your promise still stands.